Okay, well, this presentation focuses on a um, toolbox that we've developed um, in the context of the Management Institute for Quality of Life Studies. Uh, we call it Michaels. Michaels was uh, founded back in the year 2000, so it's been in operation for, for a few years. And we're doing a whole bunch of things um, to help. I mean, the, the basic mission of Michaels is to propagate the science of quality of life studies and well-being research. So the idea is to be able to help disseminate the knowledge to get practitioners, policy makers, decision makers to be able to use the science of quality of life in the best way possible so that, again, that science would be useful in so many walks of life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what we've done in relation to developing a toolbox that would help decision makers, policy makers, practitioners of all kinds to use indicators of quality of life. This is the, the, the main site. As you can see, it's you, you have two options. Once you get to that site, you can get to indicators of quality of life in the United States, or you can do a country by country analysis uh, by clicking on the World Quality of Life Indicator. Uh, so all those practitioners in the United States can use the United States at, uh, as, uh, as a benchmark to, to help them uh, gauge the quality of life of different communities and make decisions that would enhance the quality of life in those communities. At the world level, again, we'll, we'll talk about that. But the data that is, if we, if we click on this, this is what, what you'll see. The data is um, very much based on the US Census Bureau. So again, we use the, the, the census data to allow us to capture not only the demographics, but economic well-being, education well-being, environmental well-being, health well-being, housing well-being, safety well-being, shopping well-being, work well-being. So if you click on any one of those, then you can flesh out those indicators at different levels of analysis. Let me show you what levels are. Let's, let's, let's walk through an example. Let's say we can do education well-being. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to have indicators of well-being fleshed out at the community level. Well, what, what we mean by community level, this is where you get into select the geographic level, and if you click on that icon, you can have indicators at the block level, at the block group level, at the census tract level, at the county level, at the state level, at the national level. So you can get indicators associated with education well-being at these different, what you call, geographic levels. So, you, you know, the, 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 most, the most micro would be the block level, and of course you can get indicators at the national level in relation to education well-being. So let's say, let's try something at the state level. In the United States, of course, we have 50 states. And let's say maybe we want to compare education well-being with, again, what would be the point of comparison? Then you go into this other icon, uh, other window, and you select, let's say you want to compare one state against another. So let's say we, we're going to compare three different states in relation to education well-being. Uh, now which states? If we're talking about states, then you go into here. We have 50 states in the United States. And let's say for the sake of simplicity, we'll compare Alabama with how about California with, how about Virginia? So what we're doing is we're comparing the effectiveness 
of education well-being or the outcome of education well-being uh, of Alabama, California, and Virginia. And then you have, you go down there and you have the option of doing, doing this kind of comparative uh, analysis uh, using the most recent data versus a time series. Well, let's try the most recent and then you click on submit. And voila, you end up with the outcome and the outcome would be, these are some of the educational well-being data, I mean indicators that we have in the system. Elementary, well, I get, uh, this is uh, public spending. So public education spending at the elementary level, well actually elementary and secondary. And we're comparing, well, which state is doing better? Well, we've got California seems to be spending uh, a lot more per pupil than Alabama. Alabama is in the, in, the, in the blue and Virginia is in the green. So when it comes to public expenditures on schools, elementary and secondary school, again, California seems to be doing much better in terms of, uh, again, the spending per, per pupil. Uh, how about something like school enrollment? That is a, another major indicator of educational well-being and if we're comparing those three states, then you can actually get into the nitty gritty of this, which would be, well, enrollment in what kind of school? We've got enrollment in nursery school, preschool, enrollment in, in kindergarten, enrollment in grade one through four, all the way up to not enrolled at all. And you get this, the, this kind of statistic, this kind of graph that, that show you the level of school enrollments based on the type of grade. Um, how about something like educational attainment? Educational attainment is another major indicator and again we're looking at those three different states and you end up with this kind of graph and, it, and again from that perspective if you are a policy maker you know involved in education and you're at the state level then you'd be able to use the, this kind of statistic to, to drive policy making, education policy making in this instance. Okay, so this is an example of what we have in terms of indicators in the United States and you can do this also based on time series. Time series would, would tackle uh, more than one data point in time. So here we have time series uh, and, you, and it goes back well, we've got several points in time, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. Uh, this is graduate or professional degree attainment, attainment for population over 25. Um, and you, you, you have those statistics in terms of trends. So you can flesh out the trends in a way that would be, um, that would be helpful for policy making. Now, once you, once you do this, you can generate reports. And you can generate reports, let's say if you can click on the PDF file, and it says that you want a report you know, of this kind of analysis. Oops, what happened? Well, hmm. Oops. It bumped me off. Okay. Yeah. You get to select the states again. California and again we're talking about Virginia. And let's say let's do the most recent maybe because if it's if it's too much data <laughs> then sometimes the system acts up. So let's say if you want to get a report on something like this, this situation with uh, public spending on education, and you click on the PDF file. No, no. Oh, hmm. Well, anyway. You <laughs> I don't think you can do anything. It's something to do with 
maybe uh, the, the system is overwhelmed with data. Um, but anyway, you can generate a, a, uh, a report by clicking on the PDF icon, um, allowing the system to kind of digest the data, I guess. Um, or you can click on the other icon, which is the Excel file. So if you want to do a, some additional analysis, you can dump the data into an Excel file and you can do additional analysis. Let's uh, see if you can, given the, the, the fact that I don't have much time, um, let's do world, uh, uh, world analysis and let's do something also, something like education well being. Much of the data at the world level is, is provided by um, the United Nations Development Program. You've got data from the World Bank, the IMF. So we, we, we use that kind of data to um, allow policymaker at the country level now to make those kinds of decisions by using uh, those indicators. Now let's say we want to compare countries. Okay, let's do countries. Um, and you want to compare Afghanistan with what, what country would you like? Um, any takers? Korea. Korea, okay, let's do Korea. Korea, Korea, where's Korea? Korea. South. South Korea, so it has to be South. Well, North would be interesting. <laughs> So it has to be the Republic of Korea, right? It's in there somewhere, it has to be. Republic of Korea. Okay, how about another country? How about, let's say, do the UK. How about the UK? The UK, United Kingdom. So now we're comparing educational well-being in terms of these three different countries. And let's do, in order not to overwhelm the system, let's do the most recent data and submit and we'll be able to see those indicators in graphic form as well as in table forms and you'll be able to get, get the data in, in, in the context of an Excel file or you can generate reports. Uh -huh. So this is a situation, oh, so you notice Afghanistan, if you're comparing Afghanistan with Korea and the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom is doing slightly better than than Korea, but Afghanistan is way, way lacking, right? How about youth literacy? Uh, we only have data on Afghanistan for some reason. How about literacy rate, youth? And again, it's broken down by age and, um, uh, and, and gender. So you also have data from Afghanistan. We don't have data from Korea or the United Kingdom for some reason. You got adult literacy, again you got data from Afghanistan. How about literacy, adult, yeah, adult expenditure per student. We got data now from uh, both uh, United Kingdom and Korea, but we don't have data on Afghanistan. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, so you, 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 as you can see from this chart, we have expenditure per, per student and in the context of the United Kingdom, you know, the percentage of GDP per capita is much, is much higher uh, compared to, let's say, what is being spent in Korea on education per student. Public spending on education, uh, again, we have now data on the three countries, which is, which is essentially a percentage of GDP, and this is kind of interesting. Uh, the United Kingdom is on top. It spends a lot more money on education compared to, let's say, Korea and Afghanistan. And again, you generate those, uh, those uh, statistics in the context of PDF reports, or you can dump them into an Excel file, and you can build your database accordingly, and you can do additional analysis as such. 
pupil per uh, pupil teacher ratio, uh, public spending on education too in terms of the government, school enrollment, um, uh, on and on. Primary completion rate, we've got a lot of good indicators here on educational well-being. So again, the idea is to help uh, policy makers and practitioners of all kinds, let's say even you know, at, at the community level, some of the practitioners are real estate agents. You know, real estate agents who are interested in, in, in making decisions to help, um, help their clients select a certain community that uh, it would be guided by quality of life indicators. And so they, they come on the website and, ah, well, I, you know, I can, you know, they're interested in a community that ha has a high level of educational well-being. Which community would that be? And they would get, use the toolbox uh, to identify those communities. And that, again, is a tool that we think is helpful. Okay, um, on that note, I think I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. about indicators of quality of life. This year I published a book about indicators of quality of life in Latin America, but now I, I really want to speak with you about another kind of things, that is about qualitative methods for the study of quality of life, and particularly the role of the researcher, uh, trying to, to see inside ourselves what is happening when we are working. Well, first of all, to remember, in case you are not familiarized with qualitative methodology, that the main purpose of qualitative methods is to understand meaning for participants in the study of the events, situations and actions in which they are involved. The context in which participants act and the influence these methods have on their actions, as well as the process in which the actions take place which can enable the identification and generation of a new theory. Qualitative methods study intersubjective meanings situated and built by proving into the depths of social life in its natural development and exploring meaning for its actors. In this perspective, the world is built around meanings and symbols, the former being local inherent to each individual and each group on culture and to their behavior within each historical moment. Furthermore, as is the case of every process of production of knowledge in social sciences, its results also affect the persons that participate. Qualitative perspective is a social product whose production process is collective and transversally influenced by values, perceptions and meanings of the subjects in charge of their construction. An intersubjective immersion into the desired knowledge of a particular reality is a condition which allows the comprehension of its internal logics and rationality. The choice of qualitative methods implies a particular vision of the world which leads to a consideration of the essential meaning of the word, the ontology, an idea of how it may be known, I speak about epistemology, a way to warranty the knowledge of the world, the methodology, and a set of values to orient the task, the axiology. 
The qualitative researcher is expected to feel personally involved in every step of the research process. Because being a subject in the research is the chance of sharing and relating reflective experiences with the subject of research and placing oneself intentionally in their circumstances. We will reflect upon two concepts which play a major role in the process leading to methodological decision making. The concept of perspective and the concept of points of view. About perspective, we will say that this allows us to take a step back and raise our eyes beyond immediacy, assuming a point of view from which to look, since there is no longer a neutral view. Hence, all perspectives are situated, it concerned, and imply a project, for example, an intention towards the future. About point of view, we will remember Bourdieu that say that there is no such thing as a research object without a point of view, even when the object in question has been produced with the intention of revoking the point of view an equivalent to partiality. In this line of thought, the consideration of the perspective chosen by the researchers and the consideration of their points of view both sustain and mark the limits of their type of work. Regarding the methods, the debate has traditionally been centered in the relevance of choosing the quantitative method or the qualitative method. And in this sense, we are aware that each of these options implies a number of specifications, characteristic advantages and disadvantages. Likewise, it is important to remember the place of sensitivity in this process. Being sensitive means being able to penetrate and give significance to incidents and events drawn by the data. Thus, personal, professional experience may increase that sensitivity if used appropriately. We will propose three dimensions for the analysis of the role of the qualitative researcher. A personal dimension, a professional dimension and a political dimension. We speak about polit personal dimension that it is centered around the perception and personal experiences of the persons at an initial stage and though it is the essential and structuring dimension of every research process, it is not always considered first in the academic scope. The professional dimension considers the possibility of including in the scientific field professionals whose professions have emerged only in the last decades. The professional peculiarity of each of the researchers designate and condition the development of their future careers. There are professions traditionally devoted to research work, while others have come to emerge in this field in the course of the last two decades. About political dimensions, we will say that it refers to the analysis of the decision-making processes in the scientific academic field which implies the consideration of the systems of power and their different expressions. The importance of the use of qualitative methods in quality of life studies is related with the importance of considering people's perceptions, opinions, feelings, ideas and interpretations. Well, last year I published a book called Qualitative Studies in Quality of Life, Methodology and Practice is part of Seer series, the volume 25, uh, 55. The book is organized in two parts. The first one dedicated to theory and methodology. We speak about relevance of the use of qualitative method for the study of quality of life, the qualitative research in the quality of life field, the role of context and culture in quality of life studies, and the integration of qualitative and quantitative methods in quality of life studies. In the second part, there are some cases, qualitative methodology in geography, contribution to the study of quality of life, qualitative studies in health related quality of life, the case of young people living with AIDS, children's quality of life in the Caribbean and qualitative study, 
qualitative studies of young people's quality of life in urban and rural areas, young people's rural quality of life in the Colombian Andes, a qualitative study using triangulation, and a qualitative study on yoga practice in quality of labor life. Well, to finish, because we have only a little minute um, to remember uh, an idea. Adopting a particular methodology implies a philosophic, theoretical and political decision. And in the case of qualitative methodology, it is an essential approach in understanding people's experiences of well-being and discovering new issues related to quality of life. Doing qualitative research is an intense experience. It enriches one's life, it captures one's soul and intellect. Well, this is the places where I work in two different universities of my country, Argentina, Universidad Nacional de Lomas de Zamora is a state university and Universidad de Palermo is a private university. Thank you very much. But I prefer for the microphone. something where people definitely need to think really about something and it's something 
that's then kind of abstract. So, and so that's why we applied the data construction method from the first story down the common one to have an activity-based measurement. So just asking people in the end to reconstruct their day in episodes, for example, having breakfast from 8 to 9 a.m., and then to ask them how they felt in this, in this episode. So like this, we, have, we can zoom into daily life and just have way more accurate, closer to everyday life measurements to measure subjective well-being. But the third level, as this is still a reconstruction, is the experience sampling. Like to ask people right in the moment itself to have a more effective instead of a cognitive measurement, so just for subjective well-being. So in the end here, just notifying people and asking them in the moment itself how they feel, what they do, with whom, and where. But the main thing is like all of these three layers are in the end, like the idea was that when we can measure like at these different points in time, that we can definitely like have a more valid subjective measurement, which turned out also that this is, this is mostly the case. But the main thing is that we still should add also like objective markers, which is the frame around of this idea. So like just to add biological markers, other markers, so just to make a measurement model for subjective well-being more valid. So that was the basic idea in 2012. We started then as students just to develop this, got funded two years after, and now like this, this uh, adaptable research tool was like applied last year like in over 20 research studies, this year like in over 30 research studies, so just to, to measure constructs like subjective well-being in a more detailed way. To give you the feeling suggests of it, I will just show you a quick screen cost. So where you can see the basic modules of the layer. So the one thing is that you can ask like in an app just like very easy and all items so subject to the being questionnaire. So it's just that you you and participants you need less time in the end to answer because an app can score for them. And so like this you can just ask different questionnaires here. The other part is just to ask people right in the moment itself, which is like a text notification in the end. You're just asking how you feel right now, and then it's different answering options to make it simpler also for the people then to have to give like the full information, what they do right now, where they do this, and for whom. And then this is quantitative information in the end, but so it's also <coughs> possible to give them again, some qualitative information afterwards, to give a note, to make a picture, to make a voice recording, everything is always displayed in a graphical way for the participants to like really motivate them to continue to participate in the study. And the third part is the diary, so with the diary construction method, which you apply in something kind of like a Google calendar. So you're just defining in the end like an episode, and then it's the same with what you saw before. So just announcing options again to define what you did between 0 and 6 a.m., where and with whom. And so you do this in the end for the rest of your day, so which takes still some time, but so it's quicker than when you do it in a paper pencil survey, for example. And then you reconstruct and try to think about how you felt in this episode. And also this information is in the end then <coughs> just it's possible also here to give some qualitative information afterwards, as well as this information is also being displayed in a graphical way. So this is kind of like the basic tool and was the basic idea also already in 2012. So that's the main thing is that, so we applied it also for example on smartwatches, so just to be even closer for effective measurements. But so the main thing for the modules itself, what we have nowadays is like that we can display pretty much in, in an app like just every kind of questionnaire. We can ask people right in the moment itself in a quantitative way, in a qualitative way. We can do evaluated time use diaries, all the data construction methods um, in a quantitative way or in a qualitative way. We can add different biological markers. I think I can also just just uh, give you the suggestion to, to go today like just just uh, at, at to uh, Katarina's uh, session so just for this so uh, just for, for different computer science methods also for, for, for biological markers so then to have an API for other objective markers to link consumption data productivity data and so on to data sets to have also a link to make it in a methodical way easier to reward people. So it's possible in the app to just give people, for example, in long-term panels directly after their answer survey already in Amazon voucher so that they stay motivated and continue your study and you don't need to do this by hand. You can track location, you can always give the graphical review what you saw, you can, give, you can store the data on our servers or also like on your own servers or you can export it in all the necessary parts and that's like kind of like a legal package so that you can just that we can adapt pretty differently like just for, for different studies and for different apps then. So 
and we apply this in a lot of research projects, and that's kind of like the link now to the well-being test batteries. So we collect a lot of data, and especially applied projects, but also basic research projects. And so that's what we do in the end on community level, or in general for unemployed people, for the refugee study, for example, called the Happiness Atlas project, Happiness Monitoring and Employee Survey. So we try to understand better the link between happiness and productivity. Happiness Check uh, Customer Surveys, so where it's more to really understand different different products, different interventions, trainings, so just what effect they have on people's people's life and, and feelings. Happiness Monitoring is a project to make life coaching more empirical, and Happiness Magazine is more an information, but an information um, project. But the main thing is we collect a lot of data, and so the main topic about this this talk today is about the well-being test battery. And so the idea behind this is that it's really important to set up like a meta basis for having a good analysis on a psychometrical point of view. And so the main thing what we did is that we figured out a lot of different columns that we thought are really important in a psychometrical point of view for subjective well-being measurements. And we just tried to find in the end the main goal between this long-term project is to find always the most complete, but especially also the most efficient measurement for every study. And so the main basis for this is the World Database of Happiness. So one thing Ruth Farm A would like to, uh, to, to solve this year, but for Ruth Fenhoven, I hope that most of you are aware of, of this tremendous work like work from the last three decades. So we were just redesigning the World Database with, with them together and with the, with the EU group in Rotterdam, so just for the past year. And so it's going to be launched in the next few months, so just to make it easier to access the data and the work that's, uh, that's that we put in there. But the main thing is that there's like on different happiness measurements also like really a good basis from, from, from this work um, that we use in the end to put into our database, into this columns to really have a good basis of all the different measurements that were being used in the last three decades for measuring subject to being happiness and also different quality of life indicators. And so this is in the end the point like when we work and when we apply in the end like the happiness analyzer for a study it always works on a meta level so that we always define in the end which items are being used. We define then when it's a bunch of different items, so we define that as a questionnaire or even then as a questionnaire block or as a whole survey. We define clearly what are the in-app visualizations to control for own effects and we, can, we also mark which objective markers are being tracked in which study. And so this is in the end what we define and just give like a, a description in the end for, for every item. And so we can always see then when we just, just start to do in the end, like just, just a new survey app, we can always see on different devices how that, how that item is going to look like. And we can define it like kind of in a normal survey tool, like in full detail. The main thing about it is that there is a syntax behind and we work on this like continuously now to make sure that we can really build statistics for the different items to really have kind of like a good meta-analysis, a good basis in the long term for all of our studies to see how to find the most efficient and the most complete measurement for like the different studies. And so that's in the end statistics that you can see there. And then it's also possible like to make an export in the end, just like on combinations of different measurements, but you can export especially like in a meta-analysis here, for example, like all the different, different, um, different psychometrical values for example, on the satisfactory life scale for Medina, so just to make here meta analysis on it, so without like just having to get all the data from different from different sources in there. So that's kind of the basic idea between the well-being test battery. It's something that's going to continue and need to grow. So like just over the next couple couple of years. But so it's just like something that I wanted to share already in this schools conference here, because it's kind of like a mindset thing to make sure that you start this early enough and not think about something like this in five years ahead. So that this would have been a good idea. So thank you for your attention. And we are done now. So we have really, I think, good time left. So we have 20 minutes left for, for questions. So like this, I will also just sit down and feel free like, just to ask us presenters so like anything to what we presented. I have first, yeah. Uh, I can, I can, yeah, yeah, I can do this. So I just want to make sure that also for the others are uh, not, not time for questions. But so the main thing is, 
So it's, it's to make sure that you can really apply also these projects, right? So and for example, in the, in the monitoring, so what the main thing what we do is we build in the end app-based employees and employee panels. So in the end, when we go, for example, there's a study running with Accenture right now, so like just in the end, on like one, one date, all the Accenture employees are downloading in the end an app, which is measuring their subjective well-being, work engagement, commitment, and so on. And on the other side, they also are asked to do like one time a diary, so like the kind of like the their construction method, but not just asking there how they feel in certain work episodes, they also how productive they feel. So just in certain episodes. And like this, you have a nice link between subjective well-being, work engagement, and so on, and also like productivity measurements. And then we link this in the end just with objective productivity measurements, sales numbers, and so on. So just to really make sure that we can answer really the question in what way subjective well-being, um, subjective well-being um, uh, can really have an effect on that like, productivity to get in the end like a, a better outreach, like also like to the corporate sector, like.